procession of young kings. The astrologer's plate. Icarus, 1951. Icarus, 1972. The throne of heaven. Space angel. In the beginning, 1962. Adam. In the beginning, 1964. The creation of Adam. Marathon. Agamemnon. You will never know. This is the first time that I have associated the skull with shells. And for me, there's an enormous significance to this relationship because um, the shell, the living shell, contains an animal. It's a house for the animal. Yes. And uh, I see the skull as a fabulous piece of architecture, a habitation for the human animal. That's the a brain, wonderful thought. the intellect, everything that can register his experience and his living reaction. Hmm. And um, so that I think you know this version, which I liked very much because um, space seemed to become important here. And now here, in this variation, it's not bursting apart. It's all coming together, sort of centering in on the central shape, which is the skull. In, in a later version, this is all going to lead to something that I really do know a lot about. And um, the skull will dominate on a very much larger canvas and a very large skull. But I am going to include human figures standing around the skull as if they're very familiar with it, as if they could crawl in and out of the apertures. See? This shell happens to be a new shell for me. I haven't used a clam before. And it was a revelation to me because all of those shapes that I have used for years in my canvas, which I call directional arrows, pointing and usually on the horizon line, directing attention to the center. Now here, the, these points of the shell are all indicating uh, directional lines for all the objects on the canvas. And uh, it's, for me, a perfect form to introduce in, into my canvases from now on. Uh, look, the hand is something new. I found this in Paris last year, and I think it's about 150 years old. It could have been the time of Angra or Delacroix, I think. Wonderful. But it's, it's a beautiful thing because the fingers are all strung on sp springs uh, behind this metal plate. And uh, again, it becomes a directional thing for me, you see. Mm -hmm. And uh, for instance, the drawing here of the hand, this hand that is pointing to the skull. That is the great thing about this painting, yes. that the skull is all important. I think in many ways he um, had a kind of serenity, but this serenity depended very much upon there being present with him someone whom he loved. He needed somebody with him. Then he was happy and calm. And I think the down moments in his life were moments when he was alone. He needed a buffer. He needed someone who could keep in contact with the world for him, handle his material, practical needs. That role, of course, was filled in the last years of his life by Guna Massen. And Guna, who was quite a talented young man, an artist himself, devoted virtually the last couple of years of both of their lives to caring for and acting as this buffer for Alexis. He somehow had a premonition that his days were numbered and he became obsessed with this, although 
few people knew how really ill he was. He always put up a very brave front, and never allowed to discuss the state of his health. But we knew that he was a very ill man. We knew that he was going into hospital early in December, and we knew he was going to have surgery, and we were very apprehensive about this. We'd seen Gunnar, and he told us that Alexis seemed to be in a fairly good state and that they were going to go ahead with surgery. Clarice and Jack Lazarus. On the Saturday, the December the 13th, we were waiting for news, and at about lunchtime, Gunnar burst into the house, sobbing his heart out, and we knew the worst had happened. He, he called, he rushed down the passage calling Jack, and then you spoke to him, Jack, and he was in a most terrible state. Yes, well, uh, we We were absolutely shocked and stunned and, and just had to sit. And we consoled him for about three or four hours, sitting in the lounge, having a cup of tea with him, and he eventually came out with a story that Alexis uh, knew. Wanted, uh, knew that he was going to die. And uh, before he uh, went into the, into the operating room, he gave Guno instructions about his burial. And he had explained to Guno in exact detail how he wanted to be buried. He wanted to be buried in front of the modif, uh, of course, on the farm and overlooking the Michalisberg, and didn't want any fuss and, and no burial service as such. And of course, Gunnar was going to, to follow this out to the letter. What happened then is now history. Three days after Alexis Preller died, Gunnar Mersein was seriously injured in a motor accident. He died of his injuries, and they were buried side by side below the unfinished Mudif. As a young man, Alexis Preller wrote these words. It does matter what is said of his work and how much is understood from it, but it does not matter to him. His purpose is expression, and his expression is paint. That is what he is concerned with, and that is why we are concerned with him. <laughs> 